Hello, I'm Bob Gappa. And for the last 41 years, I've been helping companies that use franchising as their primary growth strategy to use that strategy to grow their brands. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jonathan Bowman for another episode in Inspiring Leadership Series. Jonathan? Thank you, Rishni, Bob. It's great to have you on the series. And you were recommended by John T. Hewitt, who we had on recently. And he, he owed, he said, a lot of his success to your wisdom and your advice. So the whole point of this series is to pass on to people tips, advice, experiences, things that have gone well, things that haven't, and, and what you've learned from them. And you also, like me as a consultant, are in the honored position of seeing a lot of different firms and what they do and what they don't do. I think 1,650 brands you've helped use franchising. So you've got a wealth of experience of what works and what doesn't work, and both in human behavior and in organizations. So tell us a bit more about uh, some of the things you've done in your life, and then we'll go back to childhood and what shaped you. But just give us in a snapshot of a few minutes, just some of the different things you did, because I understand you also qualified as a Catholic priest. Am I right, Bob? <laughs> well, uh, early in my life, when, uh, when I was five years old and I was growing up in Montana, and of course, parenthetically, I've not yet grown up, but uh, when I was growing up, and five years old, I had two heroes. One was Gene Autry, because I was in Montana, of course. And the other was my uncle, who uh, was a Monsignor, a, a Catholic priest for a diocese in Minnesota. And I admired him and uh, all the other uh, religious people that were in my family on my mother's side. Uh, and so, I wanted to be in five years of age, I wanted to be a cowboy priest. And I had uh, a, a picture of, uh, of two guns on my side and I was going to ride the range and uh, save people. Uh, and so that was a, the beginning of, a, of an influence in my life. And, and so uh, I did follow that that commitment of being at five years of age. And I did go to the Catholic seminary out of high school at St. John's uh, University and Monastery in uh, Minnesota. <clears throat> and uh, I stayed there until I was uh, one, I was three months away from what are called final vows. And uh, kind of a, a humorous anecdote in the Catholic church uh, they don't have a free agency and you can't study for a diocese that you choose to, to. You study for the diocese that you were either born in or you were in when you decided to go to the seminary. So the diocese I was studying for was Eastern Montana. And when I got into graduate school and started studying German existential systematic theology, I decided I wanted to be a, a college teacher. And uh, it didn't take me long to realize that in Eastern Montana, there weren't any Catholic colleges. And so the only choice I had was uh, to leave the study of the priesthood, which I did, and become a college professor, which I did. Wow. And uh, the interesting part about that is that when you study to be a Catholic priest, and when you're five years old, you declare that you are going to be one, it's a big deal for your family. Mm. And uh, I dialed my parents and I said, put the phone between the two of you. And I said, uh, I have decided I'm going to leave the seminary and stop studying to be a Catholic priest and become a college professor instead. So there was a little bit of silence. <laughs> and my father said to me, how can we help you? That's nice. That's really nice, isn't it? And that's a great example of, of good leadership, isn't it? How, yeah. can we, how can we help you? Not, uh, there not, was, there, not to there criticize. was never, never in my life anything said about that decision. Yeah. By my parents, except support for the one I made to move forward. That's fantastic, Bob. And, and 
as well, for 41 years, you, you ran Management 2000. You were the founder and CEO. Um, and you've, you've also really been helping with OD and design uh, for customer-centric brands and franchising. Uh, tell us a bit about the, the kind of life that you've had and, and the experiences you gained, which are relevant to people listening as they run their own businesses and learn from people like yourself. Well, I, you know, the, the, the two major influences in my life besides individual people not because one of these influences is an individual person is Peter Drucker. Oh yeah, 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 Peter who, Drucker. Who really is the father of modern management because he moved us from the military model with chain of command to the customer centric model. Uh, and he really designed the seven functions of management, the five uh, resources that every function has and the reason you do that is to get a result. And so the seven functions of planning, organizing, delegating, directing, coordinating, and controlling people, money, materials, time, and space to get a result is really what you do in your own personal life. So what I've always, what I've always believed since I discovered it is there's no difference between business and personal life except the way we name the function. So going after my son's report card, going over my son's report card, I don't call that a performance evaluation, but it is. Uh, hmm. Having good relationships with my neighbors is no different than having relationships with suppliers or team members. Hmm. Getting along with members of the family is teamwork. Uh, having goals and objectives is, and so every function that management has is a, is in, in business is the same function you have in personal life. And later I discovered that while there are 12 systems in the human body, all of which have to work together in harmony, or we can create illness or whatever, but health Health is all about being respectful for our 12 systems. And in business, I discovered ironically that after studying it for 10 years, that there are, in my mind, 12 systems in business. And so when we, when we, when we assess a client, the first thing we ask them is like, like a doctor would do to a human being, I consider myself a franchise doctor. Yeah. And I say, can I assess your business in these 12 areas? Mm -hmm. Because uh, each of these areas, like in, in, in human life, each of these areas has both a belief system behind it uh, and people behaviors who implement that belief system. And the other thing that, that all systems have are processes and technology. Mm -hmm. and, and so whether you're talking about your family or whether you're talking about your business family, you, you have beliefs that are translated into behaviors. And if they aren't, you get hypocrisy and a lack of integrity. And if people aren't well-trained and committed to following processes and using technology correctly, you won't get results. Mm. So I call those the mechanics and dynamics of life. I, I, mechanics, I mechanics being process and technology and uh, dynamics being beliefs lived. Yeah, I, I do like that. And, and I, I myself um, find it very helpful to have some models and frameworks. I call it sort of freedom within a framework but that to help an organization get some honest diagnostics from externally, um, as you were, almost like the doctor's health check, I think is a really good way of looking at it. Um, it I relate to that in some ways when I go in to be a trusted advisor to a CEO mm -hmm. and his executive team and his organization. My wife and I are looking at what is working and uh, where, where there are some pain points in what goes on and how mm -hmm. self-aware they are and then how mutually aware they are and how they're focused on a, uh, achieving a goal. I think that's brilliant. Um, 
So, Bob, taking from your life and your experiences and the things that shaped you, uh, there's some amazing things that have gone on in your life. But if you were to pick out a proudest moment and, and a darkest moment in your life and what you learned from each of those, which which would you pick? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, it, when uh, I, I just I, I hesitate because the I think the blessings come from the relationships you have that last over time. Uh, because a blessing is is uh, the uh, a, a top moment is something that lasts over time. So I would consider that the uh, the second marriage I'm in mm -hmm. uh, is the biggest blessing in my life, the proudest moment I have because uh, my my wife Pam ran a uh, a travel company, a franchise travel company that was the first and second in the United States in market share. And she did that because she was a good manager and she was also a good human being. And when we decided to get married, we formed our own mission statement as a family. And we decided our core values and we had her goals and my goals and our goals. And we had a, uh, uh, a triptych made that hangs in our, in our home. And on the left-hand side was my life, which I called chaotic. And on the right, left was hers. And in the middle was symmetry. And so we called our relationship and our getting together as husband and wife, chaotic symmetry. I love it. I and, love it. And, and that's been what I've tried to do all my life was help people create symmetry out of chaos. Mm. Well, and, and, and I, 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 I think the, the darkest moments probably yet to come. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I haven't hit my darkest moment, but the probably a, a way to, to put that instead of darkest is challenging. Yep. Uh, when I started the company in, uh, uh, I borrowed $65,000 41 years ago, and it had to be secured by the person who secured it for me. So I felt a pretty good obligation. And right after I started the company, we had a recession. And, uh, and then I was in Houston and we lost 42,000 jobs overnight. And I had $75 left. Wow. And, uh, I, and a, and a $65,000 debt accruing interest at prime plus two and prime was 21. And so with that $75, uh, you get a moment of integrity. And I thought, well, I could go get drunk or I could put an ad in the Houston Business Journal. So I said to the Houston Business Journal, how much of an ad can I get for how long for $75? And they said, you can, you can have a, a one insertion and it's small. And I said, okay. And it said, three days of free consulting. And I got one call and it formed a, a long time lifetime relationship with somebody who was also in franchising. And together when we got synergy with what we did, we nailed down a quarter million dollar contract and saved both of us. Wow. Wow. So the darkest moment turned into the brightest moment. I love that story, Bob. That's a, a really powerful one. And I think, I think it is when, when our back's to the wall yeah. th that it, it really uh, forces us to use all our, our finest instincts rather and, than become devious. So, so that one was 41 years ago. The one that's most recent, I think, was, was when uh, Pam's father came to live with us in his final days. And that's a pretty quote-unquote dark moment. But... Uh, since I had a lot of time on my hands with COVID because it really killed consulting, uh, I spent 
almost all my time taking care of him because Pam has an art gallery in uh, in Tucson here that has for four years in a row been best art gallery in Tucson. And she has 110 artists that are in her gallery. And so I was taking care of her father and it uh, that dark moment made me a better person. Yeah, wow. Um, I, yeah, I'm just, he, he really enjoyed uh, the conversations I made him have about dying. Yeah, and how old was he before he died? 91. 91, that's a good age to get to. And, and in fact, as we were discussing before the program started, I'm just about to turn 60 and you're 79, about to turn 80 in a year's time. <laughs> and, and you are a good role model to me, Bob, because I would, I would like to be working not quite as hard as I'm working now, but I certainly would like to be of value to society and to organizations and businesses as their trusted leadership advisor. And um, it, it's good to see you still thriving and in good form. And um, it, it is important how we look after ourselves. Sadly, my, uh, my late mother-in-law, who we looked after for three years before she died, and she died sadly with Alzheimer's, heart disease, lung disease, and cancer. Uh, but she was a lovely, special little Irish lady um, and died at about 76. But it just made me realize you don't know when your number's up. You do know you're going to die. Yeah. We shouldn't avoid that. People talk about passing on or we've lost him. It's always like, is he in the garden still? I mean, has he just got lost in the bushes? I mean, what's happened to them? No, they've actually died. And I, I learned to be that brutal from my brother, who's a surgeon, and um, talked about uh, last year that, that our brother David, who's 63, when he died, he said, David is going to die. He's been diagnosed with metastatic cancer and he's got about eight weeks to live he will die you need to face that we're not going to lose him he's going to be dead and and it's quite brutal but i think it actually helps us come to terms with things rather than be in denial about it um i don't know what thoughts come up as i share that with all your background and training and experience in life well you know the uh, yeah i'm I'm going to let that that uh, sit for a minute and and let you ask me another question. Yeah, I, I will do. Okay, thank you. Um, when you started out in life, when you were sixteen, knowing what you know now, and you have undoubtedly accumulated a wealth of wisdom and experience, what advice would you go back and give the sixteen-year-old Bob Gapper about this matters? focus on this but don't worry about that you really you're going to sweat too much about that and it really doesn't matter it's small stuff what would you advice would you give yourself which is still relevant for other people who've got kids at that age i'm sure well it, it uh the the interesting thing about that is uh that five-year-old awareness i had that i had a mission in life mm -hmm from role models that early was so fortunate because I never had any other thought in my, in my life other than I was going to be a priest and I was going to help other people. And I, 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 it's still part of me. Mm. And so I, I, I never had, I, I, if I could give that advice to somebody, I'd, I'd say, as soon as you can figure out something that you want to do, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, I was watching the Olympics last night and the young woman who won the gold in skate in, uh, in snowboarding knew what she was going to do. And she said when he was like 10 years old or whatever the right age is, they asked her, what are you going to do in life? And she said, I'm going to win the gold. In what year they said, and she said 2017, I think. So, but if it doesn't really matter what, it is, but as soon as you can decide that you know what you want to do, it gets rid of some of the clutter mm. and the decisions that you have to make. Because, you know, if if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. Yeah. And 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 so I I would avoid I would avoid distractions. 
Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I would tell myself. I had too many distractions. Great wisdom. Great wisdom, Bob. Thank you. Let's go around the inspiring. That, that takes me on nicely to the next bit. Let's go around the inspiring leadership compass. And, and this is from some of the work that my wife and I did around what we were interested in, what makes high performing leaders and teams. And of course, there are hundreds of thousands of leadership models, books and shelves and shelves of libraries full of them. We just find this works quite well, it's just as a framework, freedom within a framework to have a discussion about some principles of how people perform and how they live their life. And I think it would probably resonate quite well with you in what we've talked about. about. So the first one is uh, what I call the, the true north part of the compass, uh, which is your moral quotients, your integrity, your values, your beliefs, your principles you live by, what you won't do, what you will do. If you were to pick three things that you'd say have mattered massively to your success in life, which values have those been, Bob? I would say uh, personal goals drive business goals, not the other way around. I would say that you have to have an unwavering commitment to results. Um, and I would say that don't make something matter that doesn't matter. Uh, that last one seems kind of trite, but when I look back at every single argument I ever got into with Pam, my, my wife, it's because I made something matter that didn't matter. Mm. And that's a waste of time, energy, and relationships. So, and, uh, and, uh, oh, I just thought of what I'd tell myself mm. as a 16 year old. Okay, go on, let's have it. <laughs> Because this is funny, and I would, equity. I would tell myself that equity is not the name of a rock group. Okay, it's important. And then I would tell myself, learn the value of compound interest. Mm. When Andy, the son I inherited when I uh, married Pam, and on his 16th birthday, I gave him an, an, a, what I called Andy's Wealth Building Spreadsheet, where he could plug and play how much he was going to earn, how much he was going to set aside at what interest rate. And then he could see what it might look like when he was 65 or 70. And I think he would say that he may have started paying attention to it when he was 23. Wow. That's, that's... The, gift, the, the, the gift of compound interest is, is, a, is a real gift, as anyone knows who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah, the, the, the one pennies. Yeah, very powerful. And in fact, you maybe remember a, a mnemonic, Wombat. Um, back to your number three. Wombat is a waste of money, bandwidth, and time. <laughs> so yeah. so don't, don't spend time on Wombats. So I think that's, I love that one, Bob. Um, from MQ to PQ, PQ meaning and purpose, what gives your life meaning and purpose? Why have you done what you've done? What's been your calling, your dharma, your vocation? What would you say about what gives your life meaning and purpose, Bob? Uh, helping. Mm. I think that's the one word that would say is my purpose in life is, helping others help themselves. Mm. And one of the keys to that is knowing the difference between uh, thinking and thoughting. Uh, thinkers connect dots, thoughters don't. And so people say, why, why, if I ask you a question, why'd you do that? They'd say, well, I thought, and that's because they didn't connect dots. Did and, you, can I just be clear there? You said the difference between thinkers and plotters? I didn't quite thoughters, hear. Thinkers and thoughters. Oh, thoughters. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we did. T-H-O-U-T-A, yeah. yeah. Thinkers and thoughters. Uh, and also, uh, if, if we, if, if keeping commitments, is really important because obviously 
if you let yourself ever say, well, just this once. I made a commitment to myself to do this or not do this. And you say, well, I'll let myself do this just this once. Then it's not a commitment anymore. Mm. And I, I think that uh, another thing that I've discovered is really important to me, and, and I say it a lot, and people might even say who know me, he's going to say that, is words matter. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've lost a lot of reverence for words. It's it's interesting and always has been that that Peter Drucker never talked about communication in his seven functions of planning, organizing, delegating, directing, coordinating, and controlling. Because if you do those, you have communication. Mm. Uh, and most people, I think, do not know how to measure the result of what they're doing. I, I, I think the fact that we have to-do lists rather than to-be-done lists tell a lot. Mm. You know, I think very successful people begin the day with what they want to accomplish, not what they want to do. Mm. And uh, one of the most telling things to me when I go into a company is to just walk around and ask people what they're paid for. And when I do that in a, in a not so well-run organization, people will give me an activity. Uh, I'm paid to answer the phone. I'm paid to file. Uh, I'm paid to go get this. I'm paid to deliver that. I'm paid to build this. I'm paid whatever. And if you say to somebody, well, what if we can't find the file you filed? What if, what if you aren't able to successfully answer the telephone and the question someone asks you? And so you, you begin to make people aware that it, the only thing really in life that matters is results. Mm. And, and once you know the result that you're that you want to accomplish, whether it's in business or non-business, you can reverse engineer your priorities to get there. Mm. Uh, but most people do not do that. And so they end up um, not having the financial resources to live when they hit 70. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that takes me nicely on, Bob, because I think that's beautifully said that you know not having the resources when you get to 70 here you are about to come into your uh, ninth decade yeah uh, yeah and you are looking in great form and um while we joked before that you haven't always looked after your health as well as you could you did say that your mother got to 103 and your father to 75 i recall and so yes you're lucky with the genes but it's not just that alone you clearly are looking after your mental health because you're brain is as sharp as a tack, as they would say. And um, what's your tips on looking after your mental health and how you've got by uh, with your kind of routines and particularly during the last three years of the pandemic? Well, uh, curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, I've always been blessed with being curious and when you study under the Benedictine monks, you learn to be curious about how things were done and who did them first. And you learn that reading is, is the most important asset you have as a human being, because reading is a discovery process. And as long as you're curious and you're able to go to the the library or digitally find whatever it is you want. And the uh, I mentioned earlier, my, my primary, the two primary influences I had were Peter Drucker and the second one was Harvard. Right. I never went to Harvard, but the month I started Management 2000, I subscribed to the Harvard Business Review and I have every single issue since that point. 
uh, 41 years of reading the Harvard Business Review has given me most of what I know. Mm. Uh, and uh, still does. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, the, the thing that's so cool for my life is that I only had one goal that I hadn't met for my business life, and it was being on the board of directors of a private equity company that bought and grew franchise companies. And one day John Hewitt called me and asked me if I would be on the, uh, the board of directors of Loyalty Brands, his new company. And I said, really? <laughs> Let me not think about that. <laughs> the answer is yes. Because now in, uh, in the, the last 30 years I'm, I'm gonna be living, uh, as long as John keeps me, I have a built-in clientele. Mm. And it's very cool. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So from from curiosity, good for our mental health, to EQ, uh, emotional and social intelligence, which has been so key to the success of any consultant. It's all right at knowing a lot of things, but these days Google, Doctor Google, knows more than you do, and always will do. So in in the old days when you needed a library or you know someone was a source of knowledge, now the knowledge is more accessible. So the interpersonal skills in the world of AI is ever more important. What, what would be your top tip you'd give to people to develop their emotional and social intelligence, Bob? Um, be humble, mm -hmm. learn from others, don't think you know the answers, and come out of your shell and network. Uh, my greatest weakness is follow up and networking. Uh, I am uh, by nature an introvert, unless it's showtime. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm with a client, I become the consultant. And when the engagement's over at five o'clock or six o'clock at night, I become Bob. And Bob needs to be alone and get re-energized. Uh, that's a weakness to me because uh, what I what I ought to be is more energized to be networking until I fall asleep at night, like my wife is good at. Uh, you know, I'm not one of those people that has never met a stranger. <laughs> it's very difficult for me to be in a crowd of people that uh, that I don't know where I can have a comfort comfortable conversation with somebody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> however, I must say that it's my biggest weakness because I've never worked at overcoming it. So the weakness is more my lack of commitment to be make it a strength. Yeah. But yeah, it's. Yeah, there's, there's that lovely book by Susan Cain called uh, Quiet in a World That Doesn't Listen in Praise of Introverts. And actually, many of the leaders that you and I have come across and consulted to who run businesses are by nature introverts, though it is the big American sort of dream kind of image of the salesman extrovert out there, loud, kind of in your face, walk on fire, this kind of stuff which actually doesn't fit so well when you look around many of the company boards and teams that I'm in, a large proportion are quiet. And we, we find the work of Nancy Klein with creating a thinking environment to be very good because it allows everybody to have the chance to speak, not just the gobby ones. Yeah. And, and talking about uh, different people and understanding and respecting differences, inclusion, equality, what about what, I, what we call sort of cultural intelligence collective intelligence and how you've learned to get on with people who are so very different. We were talking about politics, you and I, and about uh, people accepting differences and coming to terms with uh, the legacy of what we've done both here in England uh, and in America uh, with the indigenous populations and how we've treated people. So I just wondered what your, your view was on what you've learned about developing greater 
cultural intelligence for people who are different from us. Yeah, it's again the the, the blessings that you get in life. You sometimes don't realize them until you many many years later. <clears throat> when when I was in uh, in grade school and high school in Billings, Montana, you'd never think this was the case, but my my very best friends, uh, one of them was the great great grandson of Sitting Bull. Wow. One hundred percent Native American. Another one of my good friends was Benji Sanchez, clearly Mexican. Another one of my my good friends uh, was gay, mm. and that's not a thing that was very common to know about in 1957, 58. Mm. Uh, and uh, and when I when I went to study for the priesthood at the uh, at the Benedictine monastery, there were 250 monks, largest Benedictine monastery in the world, and they assigned you when you were in the seminary what they called the spiritual director. It was actually somebody to get your you know what together, and you had to meet with this person once a week for your entire life. So for 52 weeks, for seven years, I met with the same person and he was African-American, he was a monk. And the monastery was full of people with diverse backgrounds from around the world who were monks. And so uh, I was blessed with being surrounded by diversity and inclusion without knowing it. Mm. And so in my, in my first job as a, as a college professor in Florida, in a small Catholic college in, in the middle of Florida, Dade City, uh, I came across my first sign in the doctor's office that had colored over one door and the movie theater had colored for the balcony. And I never saw African-Americans or as they were called other words in those days after dark. Wow. And I ran in, I ran into that for the first time. And then during the Vietnam War, which is when I was teaching in university from 67 to 71, uh, I, I watched uh, uh, Kent State happen when actually a, a university student was killed. Uh, I had one of my students who committed suicide uh, we had the, uh, our students were protesting the war and we had the National Guard in Florida on the campus with live bullets. And I got involved in making that at least not end up with death and violence. So, uh, and then I got involved in, in the women's movement and my awareness kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger that uh, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're afraid to let people who aren't like us into our pool of opportunity because we're insecure that we will be able to compete if the pool is made too big. And so we're scared. We have fear of ourselves. And that fear and that insecurity leads us to not be in favor of things like diversity and inclusion because the pool gets bigger and bigger and bigger and our opportunities get fewer and fewer and fewer. That of course is just the opposite of truth. Mm. And, and history has proven that. Yeah. Uh, but so I hope that was relevant. It, highly relevant and um... You know, relate this in my own experience as I grew up in Yorkshire, in um, in England. That uh, you know, at school, my friend was Mohammed, and he was the Pakistani that the others go, "Oh, he smells," but he was my best friend. And um, when I was at Santhurst, um, there were the white officer officer cadets, and then the overseas officer cadets. There were I can't think of very many 
of the UK-based officer cadets who were colored or black or Asian or, or different or gay. Though in my platoon of 28, one of the officers uh, cadets was gay, uh, though he couldn't come out about it at the time, but he did later on. And I met up with him uh, when he just left the army and he was with his boyfriend and could talk about it then. Uh, and we're still in touch as a platoon um, um, and, and everybody is very, but my best friends were from Jamaica, uh, Nepal, Barbados, um, uh, Jordan, um, and uh, Zaire. And uh, my, when I, for, like you, I, on my second marriage now and found my soulmate in Lee, uh, we got married almost seven years ago now in Jamaica with my best friend from over 40 years, uh, 45 years, I think ago it was, uh, who I met at, uh, at Sandhurst. And we've, Errol and I have stayed in touch with since and, and have been to visit Jamaica and that. But I learned a lot about difference and, and also friends who were Muslim explaining how they viewed the world and just how naive I was with my very blinkered world. Mm. And, and people, I remember at Santa's, they talk about, about the overseas students being non-swimmers because one or two of them couldn't swim very well. Um, but they just were all classified in a particular bracket, which is just utterly unacceptable today and wouldn't be the case today. But in those days, people thought that was the norm. So, and, and finally, just a, a thought of just my mother, who was very good in bringing us up. We had very little money. Uh, my father had been killed when I was two and a half, so she brought three boys up on her own. But as we went back from church, she would stop and there'd be a little old lady with all her life in her bags, little carrier bags, in her old overcoat and she would say are you having lunch today and she'd say I, I haven't got any money for lunch she said well you're having lunch with us get in and uh, we'd move across and wow. there, would be, there would be a strong smell of urine and clearly she hadn't washed but we just not say wow. anything about that we'd just get on with it and we would give her lunch and then we'd take her back to where she was living um which was walking the streets but I, I know we hadn't solved the problem, but it was my mother was teaching us for respect and dignity. Everybody is entitled to dignity. And so I, I really relate to what you've said as you grew up and you were there with uh, different people as you, you had friends and also in the in the, the seminary, the, the Benedictine monks and your your mentor. It's very powerful to me, Bob. I will always remember that. Thank you. And, and those are those are the real shaping experiences and you know they, they get rid of biases we have and uh when i was asked by uh, uh an individual named uh, uh hussein in uh uh dubai uh for three years he was after me to form a, an office in dubai and i finally said yes and uh and we have we had clients for the years that I, we were there, maybe five years that I traveled back and forth to the Middle East. And our biggest client we had uh, from all those different countries was in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> and boy, did I have biases about Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this company is a restaurant company called Albayat, and it's the second most admired brand in Saudi Arabia after Pepsi. And the, the owner of that company uh, has what he calls an amana. And it's a, a promise to make the world better than you received it. And he has a company that is, according to Gallup's definition, a great place to work mm -hmm. and a great place for customers to spend money. And they're now franchising around the world. Uh, and they, uh, they just received recognition from the uh, 2020 Expo, which was delayed because of COVID yeah. in, uh, in Dubai uh, as the, the best uh, food organization in the entire Expo. Uh, and so my bias is that only the United States knows what customer centric means. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure you know this, but one of the two biggest malls in, in Dubai has, uh, uh, 
it's 1200 stores wow in under one roof and the the diversity in 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 that mall and in that country is really amazing and what i learned was that <clears throat> those cultures that are centuries old uh understand things more than we do and what i was often able to communicate to them because they thought so much about our united states focus on the customer and i had to share with them that many of them were far more advanced in customer centricity than than we were yeah. and we could learn a lot from them yeah. so my my point is biases they yeah. got to go away yeah and, and and as you said so beautifully what we can learn from them and that takes me on to the next uh of the the principles about what makes high performing individuals and teams which is resilience picking yourself up and learning from when things don't work i love the university of michigan one of the professors there taught me about teachable moments and that that you, you either succeed or you fail but actually both of them are situations which are teachable moments. What have I learned? What am I going to do differently? And so what gives you the resilience to get through adversity? And, and how do you view, view it as a, as a learning opportunity, Bob? Well, I, I think that uh, there, was, there was a theory developed called the theory of constraints. And if you look at adversity as a constraint, it doesn't have such a negative influence on you. Uh, adversity is almost already a weight. A constraint, by definition, is able to be overcome. And so bottlenecks and constraints, if, they're, if you take adversity and rename it, you can get over it a lot more quickly. Uh, because an adversity has something, is something that, that makes you feel that you can't do much about it. Mm. But, uh, and that's how I get over it. I don't, I, I just don't look on it that way. It's a constraint or a bottleneck that I need other people to help get rid of. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, love the work of the Stoics. Um, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus, and you being a professor and a, a reader widely and deeply will probably appreciate it too. And I found um, Ryan Holiday has captured some of the thinking and The Obstacle is the Way is one of his books, which really picks some of this theme about the theory of constraints, that it, it's just an obstacle. And actually the obstacle then becomes the way that, that from what's gone on, it, it, it gives you something that maybe one door closes, but another opens. And I, and I do like that idea that controlling the controllables, what can you control, your own thoughts and your own actions, but I can't control you, Bob, and what happens in this call and, and where it might go. I can manage it, but I can't control it. And I think acceptance of what is and actually aspirations to improve things. And as you said, with the Saudi firm, leaving things better than you found them is so true, which, which is really part of legacy. And I'll come back to brands in a moment. But if we took legacy which is about stewardship and leaving things better than you found them. How would you like to be remembered uh, from a business sense, uh, Bob? And how would you like to be remembered by Pam and your family and your friends? Well, uh, I'd like to be remembered by somebody who said, he made me think differently and when I started to think differently, I accomplished more of my goals and results. Mm. Uh, one of, one of the, the big focuses I have is helping people know the difference between accountability and responsibility. Responsibility to me is the ability to respond and it takes skills, knowledge, ability, training and development to be able to respond to something. Being accountable means that you take, you, you, you're gonna make sure that the result occurs the way it was designed to occur. And 
when you said I can't tro control you, Bob, it, it made me remember that uh, what, what I like to say is I make my decisions after you make yours. To me, that's leadership is when when I can when I can inspire you to inspire yourself to make a commitment to help us as a team achieve, and you make a commitment that I don't have to watch you to make sure that you're going to do your part, then to me that's leadership. My to me, leadership is influence. Mm. And the way I influence you is to make you think differently and to make you own what you're accountable for. And because uh, you're right, I can't control you, but control in Drucker's, in Drucker's thinking is uh, the checkpoints that show progress toward plan. And, uh, and so, uh, I would say that I would like people to say he made me think differently and more correctly about how I needed to think to make the enterprise successful. Like um, as far as Pam and, and the family, um, um, he cared. Mm. Yeah. That's lovely. Because I always say, sometimes I actually say to people, I can't care about everything. And so my care button is sometimes off. Yeah. I can, I have to choose what I'm going to care about. Yeah. And yeah. if I, if I, like, I summarize my commitment to my wife this way, my job is to make her life easier. Yeah. That's a lot. Uh, my life, my my relationship with the son I inherited when I married Pam is to challenge him to be the person that he can be and isn't yet. Mm. Uh, and he and I are in business together, and and so that's my job as a resource to him is to challenge him. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, and Bob, if we just jump back to the other, the, the, the penultimate of the eight components of what makes uh, inspiring leaders and teams, which is brand, uh, reputation, image and impact, what people say about you when you're not in the room. Clearly, this is your expertise area, so you could speak for hours on this. But if you were to pick a top tip on personal brand and, and how... Um, you know, you learn from 360 or whatever else about what people think about you and, and how you're respected. What would be your tip on personal brand? <laughs> this is really cool. Okay, so, because I do think a lot about this concept. To me, you have to make a distinction between a brand and a well-known company. And to me, a brand, and this isn't my term, it's a term from Saatchi and Saatchi, the, the marketing company, is Love Marks. Yep. And do you know, uh, uh, Kevin Roberts, who wrote Love Marks, was on yeah. the podcast. Do you, have you, oh, have you listened listen to him? He's really good. I will, yeah. And so a brand, a, a brand is something that people want to experience whether they have or not. So if you fly a lot over and, and you fly internationally and you've never flown Emirates, you want to. If you've never stayed at a Ritz Carlton, you want to. Mm. Uh, when I was in high school and, and drinking beer illegally, you wanted to have Coors. And, and so a brand is something that you, you want to experience. And if you get to experience, you do it over and over and over and over and over. And the experience in, in a brand, and the same thing is true with, with a person. And so here's my summary on branding. A brand's goal is to make the customer want to come back. 
the operative word is want to come back. So my theory on brand is, and the same thing is, is true with people, but I'll get to that in a moment. In, 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 in branding, the customer gives you emotional currency. I'm sorry, excuse me. The customer gives you financial currency and you, the business, gives them back emotional currency. And emotional currency is another way of saying how I feel before, during, and after I do business with you. And, and so if, if I, as a brand, can make you want to do business with me, enjoy the process of doing business with me, and when I'm done, I say, I want to go back and do it again, that's a brand. And the same thing is true with people. And so the, the term engagement to me is interesting because engagement really links to when two people are engaged to be married or to be a life partnership. And when you're engaged, that's a period of time when you'll do anything you can to make the person want to be with you. And it's the same thing that happens with a customer centric. And, and often the thing, I, I always say this, it's kind of humorous, the thing that, that kills engagement personally is wedding cake because the it's sealed now. I don't have to pay attention to you anymore. And, and so Pam and I, like many people, continue to call each other boyfriend and girlfriend. I love like um, that. I like that. Because if 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 I treat her as my girlfriend, it's different than if I treat her as my spouse. And I hate to say that, but it's true. Yeah, that's that's very good. I love that. And so, and and so if I think the penultimate thing in is if I have a choice, and Amazon is a good thing. I sometimes go to other websites and then go to Amazon after I've been there because the goal of Amazon is to create a company that people can't live without. Yeah. And I would like to be a person that people can't live without, but I know that that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good, Bob. Very good. Bob, we've got just a few minutes left. So let's do some quick fire on two or three questions. Um, I'm going to ask you about executive teams and dysfunctional humans and uh, what your advice is about turning around dysfunctional teams. I'm then going to ask you your favorite book on leadership or a book you'd recommend people listen to. And then we'll give you your two minute top tips uh, with your leadership tip. So firstly, um, exec teams, what's been your advice about turning around um, dysfunctional teams, dysfunctional humans? Uh, to create a functional team, you, you have to have a, a vision and you have to have the strategic imperatives, and then you have to have people who contribute to those. And let me give you a quick example. In, in Loyalty Brands with uh, John Hewitt, we have a vision to open a thousand locations by 2023. To accomplish that, we have three major priorities. Locations open, happy, successful franchisees, and fanatical fans. Every person in all the verticals we have and in our support team within loyalty have to be doing something to contribute to each or one of those or all of them in order for us to achieve the vision. Now, within that, if we have people who aren't skilled at something, we'll find another place for them until and when we find that we have no place or that they're toxic. And getting rid of toxic systems, because sometimes systems are toxic, toxic systems and toxic people. We have to pay attention to those two things all the time. And I've found that the difficulty is in helping people become aware that they're toxic and didn't mean to be. Mm. A lot of my career has been doing that, helping people understand that they have unintentional consequence, unintended consequences with their behaviors that they never intended. And some people can change that and some can't. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. No, that's really good. Uh, I, I'm just thinking of one of my clients and a very influential member of that exec 
whose unintended, unintended consequence of their behavior is they create yeah. a psychologically unsafe place where they belittle others and don't treat them with dignity. Um, thank you for that. So penultimate question is about a leadership book that you would recommend the listeners around the world in 55 countries, 185,000 of them or more. Uh, what book would you recommend to them? Well, I, I, I think that if I could, there are, are two. Okay. One is The Effective Executive by uh, Drucker. And uh, the, the other one is uh, a book uh, entitled Helping and well, uh, I'm, I'm 79, the author went away. <laughs> it'll, it'll come to you in a moment. It'll come, it'll to, come to me in a moment. Okay, but it's called Helping. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. We'll find it. Actually, well, it's, I'm going to look up here because it is. Uh... Now, if you look up there, you'll be you'll find your wife's nicked it. <laughs> Like I do this, I look to one side. And oh, go ahead, there's go ahead, this go great, ahead. there's this great book called Snakes in Suits, and oh, what's it gone? <laughs> Lee's borrowed it. Well, I've got this other good book, which is like uh, Why CEOs Fail, and I go, oh, Lee's borrowed that one as well. Um, well, I know. Hey, look, don't worry, we'll find it. Go ahead, then. go ahead. So, um, Bob, if you would, uh, for the final two minutes, perfect timing. If you would uh, introduce yourself again, as you did at the beginning, just say who you are and, and, and what you've done and do now, and then give us your top tip and we'll then wrap up the program and I'll chat to you when we finish recording. Can I have more than one? You can have more than one. Number one, I would say is personal goals drive business goals. Mm -hmm. If uh, the second one would be don't make something matter that doesn't matter. The third, I would say, is live the life you sing about. The fourth would be keep your commitments. And the fifth is if everything is a priority, nothing is. Well, that's brilliant. Bob Gapper, thank you very much indeed. And that wealth of experience that you've brought with your 79 years of age is phenomenal. I know that uh, John values you very highly. And loyalty brands are very lucky to have you on their board. And uh, thank you for making the time to share your wisdom and experience with us all. Wow, that went fast. Thank <laughs> you. My pleasure.